Radio New Zealand News. Good evening, I'm Peter Fry. The death toll from the collapse of a viewing platform on the west coast today could rise. Fourteen people died and four are seriously injured after the platform at Cave Creek inland from Punakaiki collapsed, plunging them 30 metres down a cliff face. This is the story of a national tragedy. What really happened at Cave Creek and why? Cave Creek shocked the nation, and three years on, the families of those who lost their lives remain deeply affected. How could the actions of a government department lead directly to the deaths of 14 young people? No one would be found negligent, no one lost their job over it, and for a long time, no one resigned. The people and the government of the day wanted answers. A commission of inquiry was appointed. It was headed by Graham Noble, a district court judge from Christchurch. On the first day of the hearing, the Department of Conservation, referred to as DOC, immediately accepted responsibility. The commission was to find that the platform was not constructed in accordance with sound building practice. This resulted in a total and catastrophic failure. But the commission decided that it would be quite inappropriate to point the finger of blame at any one of the individuals. Judge Noble called it systemic failure. The system failed to work. But for most of the parents, three years after the catastrophe, it's not a closed case. I just want some honesty brought into the whole thing. And I want the due process of law followed. Something can't be man-made and break and kill all those people and nothing happens. They built a death trap and let our kids walk into it. Cave Creek to me is, was a very black day in New Zealand's history and it, it for us, the families, it hasn't got any brighter. The story of Cave Creek will be forever woven in the coarse fabric of New Zealand's west coast. The coast is known for its rugged beauty and rich natural reserves. But it's a rugged beauty scarred with the tears of coal mining disasters, lost trampers, fishermen swept out to sea, and townships uprooted by floods and earthquakes. It's a region of small and close-knit communities. Greymouth, with some 13,000 people, is the main town. On the road south is the Taipotani Polytechnic. A simple plaque lies here, remembering the students who lost their lives at Cave Creek in April 1995. This photograph shows some of the students from that year's outdoor recreation course. Sam Lucas was thrilled to be one of them. There's an outdoor recreation course looking at outdoor pursuits like caving, um, rock climbing, kayaking, mountaineering, um, do a bit of skiing in there, um, tramping, looking at all your bush skills and then going over theory like your risk management, looking at weather interpretation um, and sort of a bit of theory stuff as well, first aid. In 1995, there were 40 students enrolled in the course. They were nicknamed the Outdoor Wreckers. For many, it was their first time away from home. Most would live at the Polytechnic's hostel. Next door is the local Catholic high school, where Andrew McCarthy teaches science. So far, we're still okay. Let's put another two people slightly foot. Every year he gives a physics lesson on what went wrong okay. at Cave Creek. Andrew McCarthy has good reason to pass on the lessons of Cave Creek. His daughter Kathy was on the platform when it collapsed. 
If in building you ignore the rules of physics, people can die. Until the course, Kathy had been living with her mum in Paihiatua. Kathy was hoping to have fun. Um, that was what life was about. Kathy and I had a lot together in the outdoors. Originally, I can remember sort of saying, come on, Kathy, keep going, you can do it and stuff. And then it sort of got to the stage where it was the other way around and Kathy was saying, come on, Mum, you know, you can do it. <laughs> she was a very demonstrative sort of person. Um, we got on fairly well at times, and at other times we didn't. The students had come from all around New Zealand. They had a variety of backgrounds, but together with Kathy, they shared a love of the outdoors. Kit Pawsey was raised in North Canterbury on a 6,000 hectare sheep station that both his parents work. Went off to high school and then he really hit the system and we got to know all the discipline masters and the headmaster and the head of the hostel quite well because he was difficult and he just wanted to be different. And he always stood out. And then we took him over to the coast and we pulled up outside the hostel in the nurse's home there and Kit got out and there were all these other kids identical to Kit. And Harry and I sort of looked at each other and thought, oh, Kit's come home. He's found his peer group. When he came back for his first holidays and the May holidays, but two or three weeks before the, the, the tragedy, he was a different guy. He was standing tall, he was, he was sort of unfolded himself and he was standing at full height and he was alive. Judy Davis was from the capital, Wellington. He'd been raised most of his life by his dad, Rod, a lecturer at Wellington Teachers College. Jody hated sitting still. There's no way that Jody would sit and watch a television program, regardless of the weather. Like, he was one of these kids, if it was stormy and rainy, he loved it, on with the gear, and he would just go out walking, hiking, climbing. He would try, just try things, like just have a go at things, so co constantly moving. Paul Chisholm grew up in Christchurch, one of a family of seven. His dad had died of a brain tumour only four years before Cave Creek. This left Carol and his mum to manage the family on her own. He got into the course right at the last minute and into the hostel the day before he went, I think. That was how Paul was. He was very impetuous, quick decisions, and then he was off. And, and then it was just, everything was just fantastic. He was just full of life, full of fun, always, always had been like that. For Evan Stewart, life was one big adventure. Growing up on a hill country sheep and cattle farm in Nelson's Cable Bay provided the perfect playground. He had a dream and he just wanted to get into being a hunting guide or some sort of outdoor pursuits. Yeah, he just loved the outdoors and he, he was suddenly finding he could actually do rock climbing. He was good at it. He used to say, Mum, there's something I can really do. <laughs> he was um, a character. He had good people skills and he just loved challenges. He used to say that um, the farm was his backyard but Nelson Lakes National Park was his playground. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Shaw grew up in Wairoa in northern Hawke's Bay. His father Andrew ran a helicopter business. Peter and his dad were heavily involved in search and rescue. When he left school he worked for me with the helicopter for two years and uh, we, we were good mates. We, we did, did a lot together. We went hunting, I taught him to shoot at an early age and, and he was very good at it. He was irrepressible really, you couldn't keep him down. You know, he was in the local search and rescue since he was 13 and he was the youngest um, team leader, he had a team of his own by the time he was 18. Loved the bush. Oh, he was just adorable, I mean, just a really, really good kid. He uh, never really gave us any trouble. And he was kind too, he was a really kind kid. If he, if he thought he'd upset you, he would always come later on and make amends about it. He was, was kind. The young students, who quickly became great mates as the outdoor wreckers, came from closely knit homes and from broken homes. But as they were making the transition into adulthood, they would all share a sense of coming home to a new family. A family of fellow adventurers pursuing a life of challenges and risk taking. But what possible risk could there be in a simple field trip along a newly constructed walkway.
the beauty and diversity of the South Island's west coast attracts thousands of tourists each year. From the famous Punakaiki rocks, the Papua National Park stretches inland to the Southern Alps. In between, a dramatic limestone landscape. Cave Creek is about 20 minutes drive inland from the Punakaiki rocks. It's part of a deep labyrinth of caves and underground rivers. The perfect setting for an outdoor recreation course. In this rough and unpredictable terrain, you're advised to keep to the beaten track. It was to this environment that the students were taken on their April field trip. As usual, the students would divide into two groups, A and B. On Thursday, the 27th of April, 1995, Group A left Greymouth for Cave Creek. The course tutor was John Skilton. I was, you know, hoping to open their eyes, make them, as they're doing these outdoor activities, not just to focus on the activity, but to focus on um, the environment they, they were doing it in. Today, for our benefit, Les Wright, a local guide, is taking a group of hikers into the National Park. The Department of Conservation have supplied the vehicles. Les will take the same route that the students went that day. A kilometre north of Punakaiki, you find Bullock Creek Farm Road. It winds gently eastward up the valley for about seven kilometres. The 20 minute drive brings you to the Bullock Creek Farm Flats. From here, you begin a kilometre walk along the Cave Creek track. James Lynch was one of the Group A students that day. Everyone was really happy to be going somewhere, somewhere that we hadn't been, that we'd been told was a really gorgeous place. I guess the feature of the day was going into the, uh, the ravine, the actual Cave Creek itself. There's nothing here now, but in April 1995, you came to a timber viewing platform, a few metres off the track to the right. Today, a barrier keeps you well away from the edge. We all sort of raced onto the platform to, you know, capture the view. Then uh, Neil dropped an umbrella off the edge of the platform, and so everybody, of course, rushed to the, the outside edge of it and watched it fall. I guess that's when we started to notice that it was, it was flexing. The flexing motion of the platform gave off a slight bouncing sensation. Not everyone felt it, nor did it worry most of those who did notice it. People took it. Sort of quite lightly really, it was almost a bit of a joke that, that it did. One person who did feel the flexing was Shirley Slatter, the manager of the Dock Visitor Centre at Punakaiki. She had come along to tell the students about the area. They all started bounding onto the platform, this whole group of, of students, and they're quite big, I mean they're fully grown adults, and they all bounded on, oh, I haven't had this many people on here before. It's just a wooden structure, you know, it's like a wooden bridge. Um, and they started, oh, hey, what happens if we jump? And they started jumping up and down, and I got a bit of a fright at that. And I could see sort of, had these big, long prongs that stuck out. And I could see the front one just sort of wavering in the wind a little bit. And I hadn't seen that before, so I said, oh, hey, guys, half on at a time, I think. And no jumping. She was sufficiently concerned to mention the matter to John Skilton, the polytechnic tutor. Well, I didn't notice anything myself at all, and uh, I was on the platform the whole time. Later, back at Punakaiki, Shirley Slatter also reported her concerns to her boss, Stephen O'Day. That night I went back and I told Stephen O'Day about it. Just asked him if he would come out and see what he thought, because he was a bit more experienced. I didn't know anything about wood. Stephen O'Day had recently taken over as the manager of the Punakaiki Field Centre. He was due to travel north the next day for his son's eighth birthday. Instead, he postponed and agreed to come with the Group B students to see what Shirley did and have a look at the platform. So, apart from this brief but significant moment, the moment when Shirley Slatter noticed the viewing platform flex, the day for Group A passed smoothly. The next day, Friday, April 28th, was Group B's turn. 
The day held great promise for the group, which included Leanne Wheeler and Sam Lucas. We left Tech at, at about 9 o'clock-ish, I guess, and just cruised up. Everyone was happy, beautiful day. It was such a beautiful day that when it's sunny on the coast, it's just like, that's awesome. You could see all the way up the coast and the waves all coming in. And I remember Paul Chisholm was sitting in the back and you know how you go up the road, there's all those big cliffs and stuff up the side. I remember him talking about how he was going to climb them and you know, he was going to get to the top of those one day. And Annie had the van in second gear and she didn't realise it was as deep as it was and she switched down to first halfway through and <laughs> she stalled it. So we're sitting in the middle of this puddle, not going anywhere. And she sat in the car and laughed and giggled away and John climbed over the, over the front and hooked up a rope and we pulled him out. Today, Sam Lucas is once again walking the Cave Creek track. From this point on, Sam doesn't remember what happened. Leanne will never forget. So then we walked up to the top of the hill and we kind of congregated at the top of the hill that's there. That's kind of the last time that we were a group, that we were sort of all, all hanging out together. And... Because of a sore knee, Leanne would fall behind the main group. While further up the track, Shirley Slatter would also separate from the students. I slipped and I twisted my ankle and I had this urge to go and relieve myself. So I said, I was right at the front of the group at that stage, so I asked um, Steve O'Day and John if they could carry on while I ducked off into the bushes. Tutor John Skilton continued with the party, but when they arrived adjacent to the platform, he too went into the bushes to make a comfort stop. I went off to, to relieve myself probably about 10 metres, you know, 20 metres, 30 metres away from the actual platform. Dock manager Stephen O'Day and 17 students walked on to the platform. And um, it was just this almighty, indescribable noise, really. None of the remaining five could see the platform fall, although they were only metres away. We kind of ran a few steps and almost immediately everyone, all five of us that weren't on the platform were sort of in the same place at the same time. I just couldn't believe it. There was just nothing there. Everything had gone. There was the piles and the stairs and nothing, no sign of anybody. We were kind of like, what's happened, you know, what's going on. And we could see the steps there. We had, we knew something had been there and, and John could basically just sort of say, oh, there's a platform there, a platform that's sort of fallen. In. It was quite obvious to Shirley and I what had happened, but it wasn't so obvious to the other students who were accompanying us because they hadn't seen the platform before. So I don't think they initially understood what had happened, but I did. In all, 18 young men and women crashed 30 metres to the bottom of Cave Creek. Only four were to survive. One of them was Sam Lucas. Yeah, well, I come back here and I sort of go down to where the platform was and you sort of look out there and you think, it's really weird that such, you know, I guess a big moment of my life has happened at the spot and I don't remember a thing, you know. You're trying to recall stuff and you think, I don't want to remember this anyway, so you just let it go and it's, you know, it's fine. I broke both my radius and ulna, my elbow on my left, um, which, which required a, a plate in my ulna and some wires in my elbow, and then I broke my jaw in two or three places, broke a few teeth, and then I did my ligaments in my right knee and, and bashed my, my other knee. Stacy Mitchell was the luckiest survivor. Incredibly, he escaped without serious injury. As the others fell off the platform and ahead of it, he held on to the rails and effectively surfed the platform to the bottom. It started to sway and then it sort of it tilted forward and everyone fell forward and started screaming, but then it fell up there. There's no way anyone could get off it. Caroline Smith fell but remained conscious. She broke her leg in three places. 
Stephen Hannon is the fourth survivor. He was so badly hurt he was lucky to live. Stephen received breaks to his legs, arms, ribs, and jaw in three places. A ruptured bowel, collapsed lung, and smashed vertebrae, which all added up to incomplete tetraplegia. Since the tragedy, he spent 16 months in hospital and has had over 10 operations. Physically, he's nothing like the fit young man who went off to Taipotany Polytechnic. I mean, they told me for a long time that I was paralyzed and that I'd probably never walk again. I was a tetraplegic and I'd never play sport again. I think I got a bit sort of withdrawn then for quite a while. While Stephen narrowly escaped death, 14 others would not be so fortunate. Radio New Zealand News. Good evening, I'm Peter Fry. The death toll from the collapse of a viewing platform on the west coast today could rise. Fifteen young people are dead after the platform at Cave Creek, inland from Punakaiki, collapsed, plunging them 30 metres down a cliff face. The hospital still trying to contact relatives of the dead and injured, mostly teenagers from the Taipotini Polytechnic in Greymouth. The news just came on, and the first thing I heard was them say that there'd been this accident down the west coast, and that they actually said 15 people had died at that stage, I think. Peter was the sort of kid that if, if he'd been okay, that he would have moved heaven and earth to, to phone us to let us know. And I just kept praying all the way home that I'd get a phone call on the car phone to say that it wasn't true. <laughs> Till nine o'clock at night, we were trying to find out information and waiting for these promised phone calls, which never came. I rang the police again and they wouldn't tell me anything and said to ring the hospital, so I rang the hospital and I got hold of a, a woman there who, this, this was about eight o'clock at night by then, and um, she said she couldn't say anything officially, but not, not to hold out too much hope. And the phone just, people were ringing saying, have, have you heard? And we couldn't tell them that he was dead or alive. And I said, is Kit alive or is he dead? Can you please tell me? And he said, you haven't been told. And I said, no, I haven't been told. Um, I said, Kit is dead, is he? He just said that they had a person that they thought was Stephen O'Day and would I be prepared to identify him? And, yeah. There were three things, I think, that told me that was real. And one was the voice, Betty's voice, when she rang up and said there's been this awful accident. One was when... Um, Oh, the minister who was ringing up the people, he, you could hear the grave sound in his voice. And the other one was when the um, undertaker came around and he was going through the things and you think, this is real. So that was, uh, yeah, three, those three things sort of stood out. Once we'd found out he was dead, we, I just wanted to get everything going, his arrangements for his funeral quickly. and, and it, the minister said, do you want him cremated or buried? And I just broke down. I just, I just collapsed on the floor in, um, in a heap. The hardest part for me was telling Marjorie that her son was dead. <laughs> My whole life just went to pieces, really. <laughs> um, all these terrible facts just came out, and I had a breakdown. Then it just all caved in on top of me. It was hard to accept that they'd gone, you know, so quickly. They were so vibrant, they were so full of life, and they were such a fine group of young people. You think, no, it's a bad dream, it'll all go away. You know, somebody's tricking you. You know, he's going to walk in the door. No, not to be. The next day, the parents started arriving in Greymouth. For some, it was important to see where their children had died. They made the heartbreaking walk into Cave Creek. We walked in where they walked, and we walked to the platform where they walked. But when we got to the platform, it wasn't there. And that was one of the most shocking things, finding the insubstantiability of it. And we looked at it, and we had our 
farming friends with us and we we just looked and everyone shot their heads and where are the bolts? Where are the where are the supports? Where's the counterweight? We we couldn't believe that someone like Doc would do something like that. What had gone wrong? Who was to blame? How could Doc, a government department, allow such a thing to happen? Many families attended the commission of inquiry. They would be stunned as they listened to the evidence and heard blow by blow exactly what happened. Christchurch lawyer Grant Cameron represented the victims, the survivors, and the immediate families. With every passing day in court, there were new revelations, if you like, and it had an ongoing emotional trauma for the families of considerable magnitude. Wellington barrister Hugh Rennie QC represented the Department of Conservation. I think with the dock workers, people understood in the Commission of Inquiry how difficult it was for the families and for the survivors. Um, I don't think many people actually saw the network which we had to um, set up in respect of the dock workers when they came to give evidence. And we would have people sitting with them the day before. We would have people ready to gather them up afterwards. We'd have people to take them away. They, they were um, in at least uh, as stressed a state um, as those who came from the side of the victims. The inquiry revealed just how the platform was built. The idea behind it was simple. Along with the boardwalks and tracks, it would be part of what the department called a long walk through the Bullock Creek farm area. The concept was to provide easier access to the wilderness while protecting the environment and ensuring public safety. The long walk and the platform at Cave Creek were the brainchild of this man, Kevin Wilde, Doc's northern operations manager for the west coast and his Nelson counterpart, Trevor Worthy. The idea was commendable, but from this point on, the design and execution of the platform project read like a cautionary tale. Kevin Wilde handed the task down to the manager of the Punakaiki Field Center, Craig Murdoch. Murdoch knew the platform was to be erected in a vulnerable place, but he had never been involved with the construction of a platform before, nor did he recognize the need for specialist input. Murdoch delegated the job of preparing the plans for the platform to a conservation worker, Les Van Dyke. Van Dyke was not an engineer, nor even a carpenter. He was a motor mechanic by trade. Commissioner Judge Noble would find that Van Dyke did his best to carry out a task for which he was not qualified. He was unaware of that, and he ought never to have been put in that position. He was asked to do something that he shouldn't have done, he shouldn't have been asked. He did his best, and he came up with a plan which if it had been faithfully followed, Kit and the others would still be alive today. Kevin Wilde, Craig Murdoch, and Les Van Dyke, three of the men most closely involved in the concept and design of the Cave Creek viewing platform, all declined to appear in this film. By early November 1992, Les Van Dyke had finished his plans. Kevin Wilde approved them on November the 5th. Wilde did so without referring the plans to a professional engineer, Indeed, at the time, it was not general practice to do so. So over the next few weeks, Les Van Dyke built the wooden decking and railings at the Punakaiki workshop. In December, a helicopter carried the prefabricated decking to Cave Creek. But despite the project being well underway, no one had addressed the question of a building consent. On New Year's Day 1993, the new Building Act came into effect. From this day on, the Building Act compelled government departments, such as DOC, to apply to a local authority for a building permit. A building would include any structure which, if it collapsed, would result in a person falling more than one meter. In June 1992, all managers were sent a memo outlining changes to the Building Act, but the project manager of Cave Creek, Craig Murdoch, thought the memo referred to buildings like visitor centers and huts, not platforms. Gary Reed is a Christchurch chopper pilot. When he's not flying, he spends hours poring over documents trying to comprehend the disaster which killed his daughter, Deanne, who, at 16 years old, was the youngest student on the course. 
It's interesting to note that they maintain ignorance of the building consent process and the Resource Management Act, but the evidence would show that the northern manager, his region extended right up to the seal colony north of Westport at Cape Fowl, and, and he successfully built platforms and he used the building consent process and the Resource Management Act correctly. And yet, a few months later when he goes to Cave Creek, he claims ignorance of these rules and regulations. At the time of Cave Creek, Hugh Logan was Doc's regional conservator for Nelson. Today, he's in Wellington as Doc's top man, the Director General. The department at the time failed to recognise the implications of the Building Act for the, the whole breadth of its, um, its operations. The fact that the building and the consents were required was recognised within the department, but instructions um, to to adhere to that were not pushed down far enough within the organisation. So as 1993 got underway and the Building Act came into force, it should have been clear that the Cave Creek platform required a building consent. But no one on the West Coast who knew anything about the project gave any thought to applying for one. And this was just one of a series of oversights and dreadful misunderstandings. For four months from December 1992, the prefabricated platform and other building materials just sat under canvas at Cave Creek. Then, on the 22nd and 23rd of April 1993, a couple of so-called working days were planned in the Paparoa National Park. Dock office staff could work in the field helping with track maintenance and clearing. Eighteen staff turned up. They were arranged into groups and given a number of tasks, including track clearing and the building of steps. One group of four was given the important job of setting in the piles and bearers and assembling the viewing platform. The four were Kevin Wilde, the boss of Dock's northern region on the west coast. Mark Davis, a mining officer with experience in blasting. Colin Mulqueen, a labourer, a self-described jack-of-all-trades, and Graham Quinn, a conservation officer who had completed a carpentry apprenticeship. As for Les Van Dyke, the man who designed the platform and had already built the decking, for some reason he was assigned to another group, upgrading the track. It always remained a mystery to me why the person who designed that, Les Van Dyke, was not allowed to complete the job. And I got the impression that this was Les's big thing in life, this was his big project, and. Um, and I'm sure in my mind that he had been allowed to build that, complete that construction of that platform that took everybody to be alive today. Not only was Van Dyke excluded from the platform construction party, no one consulted his plans beforehand, and no one took them to the site. Van Dyke thinks he would have given a set to Mulqueen, but can't recall for certain. Mulqueen says he was never aware there were plans and doesn't recall ever seeing them. Van Dyke claims he did discuss the plans with Wilde. Wilde says it was possible, but he's certain he was never given plans to take to the site. In the event, no plans were on site. Indeed, Mark Davis told the commission, Not much was discussed about the way the platform was to be built. So how did the four men go about the job? We asked engineer Philip Cook to supervise the construction of a full-size version of the platform to demonstrate exactly why it failed. Philip's sister, Anne-Marie, died at Cave Creek. We used the same materials. Timber decking, timber handrails, uh, there was timber bearers and timber joists as well. Uh, fence posts with the piles. Two registered master builders and some engineering students carried out the project on the lawn at the Auckland Unitech. Carefully following the sequence of events as outlined in the Commission of Inquiry, our team quickly discovered the major flaws. To start with, there was no drill, so they couldn't use the bolts to secure the piles to the bearers. The bolts were left lying on the ground and nails only were used. Also missing were the lengths of steel that Van Dijk had ordered to secure the platform to the concrete counterweight. The steel never made it to the site 
and disappeared altogether. No plan for the precise location of the piles was prepared. No grid was laid out on the ground. Mulqueen explained that the pile driving depended on the nature of the ground. Adjustments had to be made to work around rocks and tree roots. They never used any form of string line, spirit levels. Everything was done by eye. They started ramming the first foundation pile in, and where I've described the bank was cut away underneath. This first foundation pile went straight through the earth and came out the other side. So if they'd kept, they stopped hammering, of course, if they'd kept hammering it, well, the pile would have gone straight through and down 100 feet. And they've ended up with three piles across the front. Because of the ground was, as it was, rocky and tree roots and that all round, they placed the piles as they saw fit. None of them are in a straight line. It's a point that Andrew McCarthy makes clear in his physics lesson on Cave Creek. And we're having a look at how the piles were set up. Yes. Right. Slightly skew with. So you want it like that? In order to attach the bearers to the piles, they use packers to create a straight line. And I've used 100 mil nails to go right through the front bearer board, the packer, and into the pile. The nail came barely one or two millimetres into the pile, so the joint was just was useless. Now, in pile P11, it wasn't put in line. There's the length of the nail. That's where the head of the nail goes to. That's at best. But look what happened if you don't nail it in the right place. Can you see that there? It will soon work its way out. Here's probably the best way of doing the piles. Cut it in, put a bolt in, and although it appears to be wobbly, because of the thickness of the bolt and the way it's attached, it'll be a lot stronger. With the bearers attached, the piles were trimmed to an even height. The work to this point took most of the first day. The next day, the prefabricated platform was assembled on top of the piles, and again, 100 mil nails were used. They decided on the amount of cantilever by pushing the boards in and out as to how much you could see down of the view below. And that's how they arrived at their cantilever. So there was no mathematical tables or weights and measures, nothing. They just decided it out of their heads. Kevin Wilde and Mark Davis also spent part of the second day digging a trench at the back of the platform, while the others finished off the decking and handrails. The idea was to come back another day and build a set of concrete steps which would be attached to the platform by bolts. Davis told the commission, I thought that the platform was going to be bolted onto the counterweight when the counterweight was poured. There was no discussion about how this was going to be done. The building of the concrete counterweight was to be completed later. In fact, it would be a year later. In the meantime, the four platform builders finished their handiwork, walked out onto the end of the platform and had this photograph taken. They obviously didn't realize just how unsafe the platform was without the counterweight. It looked good. Uh, you, could, you could look at it on the surface and you know, it looked reasonable to, to the eye uh, standing out in the bush. Underneath the connections are, 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 are frightening. Everybody accepts that that platform was badly built. But why didn't anybody go back and check to see if it was safely built? How could it be that a, you have a government department that doesn't actually check to see the structure is safe before you advertise it for public use? To test the strength of our platform, we loaded it with rubbish bins. We filled these with water to achieve the weight equal to the 18 people who fell at Cave Creek. Remember, our platform was made with the same materials and the same specifications. The Cave Creek platform differed slightly in that it was lightly attached with nails to the concrete steps, which were eventually poured. After half an hour, we would reach the weight of only 10 people. <laughs> It was slow 
29 minutes, but the actual failure occurred in half a second. It was frightening, this, the speed of it. The term was put on it that it was the number eight wire, thinking of New Zealanders, but if they'd had one bit of number eight wire on that platform, it would have stayed there. Um, most people would just automatically build a thing a lot stronger than what it was. The Commissioner Judge Noble would find that not one of the men who built the platform fell below the standard of care required of them. Grant Cameron has his own opinion. I can't accept the view that people fell or did not fall below the level of care required of them uh, as regards their particular jobs. There is ample evidence to show that individuals fell below the standard of care expected of them and in overall terms there was a lot of negligence. Part of why Judge Noble um, uh, felt that they had not fallen below a standard was that they were trying to achieve a safe standard. They, they weren't reckless or uncaring or trying to get the job over so they could go to the pub or anything like that. They were trying to do their very best. They may have thought they were doing a good job and they had the best of intentions, but in, in reality, what they built was a disaster. The people who were responsible should have all been penalised in some way. I didn't want people prosecuted for manslaughter or anything like that, but I think if you're working for an organisation and you underperform or perform as badly as they did, there should be some form of censure. You should lose your job. That's what would happen in private enterprise. Dr Alan Ray, an independent engineering consultant, examined the platform construction for the Commission and made this model to illustrate how the platform failed. When the weight of the people was on the platform, the main load was hanging out here over the cliff face and the initial failure occurred on the joint from the bearer to pile P9 which failed in shear allowing the bearer to slide down the face of the pile. The joint to pile 10 then failed followed by the connection to pile 11 allowing that whole front bearer to slide down that face. Following the failure of the front section the connection between the platform and this bearer and the connection into the top section of the steps, which again were nails, that connection line started to fail. This allowed the platform to rotate about this central bearer line and slides down the face. Dr Ray pointed out how the platform would have been stronger without the second row of piles. What did the second row of piles have the effect of doing? In the event of failure at the front, it made a fulcrum which flicked it off the back and gave it a far steeper angle and then the whole platform slid into the cavern. For an entire year from April 1993 to 1994, the uncompleted platform at Cave Creek just sat there. Its concrete counterweight had still not been poured. It was open to any tramper who cared to step out onto it. And there would be two official visits during the year. In September 1993, the Department of Conservation's West Coast Conservator, Bruce Watson, took the local district council on a tour. A few of the group walked onto the platform. One of those in the district council party, Frank O'Connell, was apparently heard to make a light-hearted remark about whether the necessary building consents had been obtained. This remark raises the issue of whether the council had some responsibility to then check the legality of the platform. I think the Buller District Council uh, has some responsibility in a negative sense. I, I don't think you can actually put your finger on anything they did and say that it was necessarily wrong, but had they been rather more active in looking at structures and um, looking at the compliance issue, uh, then clearly we wouldn't be in the situation that Cave Creek got into. Frank O'Connell denies making any comment about building consents. The matter remains unresolved. 
In April 1994, a full year after the platform was erected, the odd jobber, Colin McQueen, was asked to finish the job and pour the concrete steps. He had no supervision, no plans, and no instructions to use steel to attach the concrete to the platform. Besides, there was no steel on site. He didn't understand why he was putting this lump of concrete there. Hence, the concrete was not strapped to the platform. It was just there as steps. Mulqueen told the commission, I believe that we had fixed the structure adequately and securely to the piles. I did not see the pouring of the concrete as integral to the safety of the whole system. It seems Mulqueen never wondered what the concrete was for. As it was, he finished the job by covering the steps with wooden decking. The Commission of Inquiry had this to say on Mulqueen. Although I found his credibility on the issue of why the concrete was poured to be problematic, on balance I conclude that he probably did not think about this. It was no part of Mr Mulqueen's duty. He never had the steel. He didn't know the steel was to go there. What he was told to do was to go up on one workday and put timber together. He was told on another day to go up and pour concrete. He did those things. The man instructing Mulqueen was Craig Murdoch, the Punakaiki Field Centre Manager. Judge Noble found while Murdoch was supposed to have been project manager, he did not know that. He thought, mistakenly in the absence of the requisite knowledge, that Mr Mulqueen was capable of building a safe structure. From Doc's point of view, the job was now finished, but the platform had no building consent, no engineering report, and no one had made a safety check. Then, in July 1994, three months after the platform was completed, there was a second official visit. The West Coast Taipotony Conservation Board made a trip to Cave Creek. The issue of consent would be raised. The board was accompanied by Bruce Watson, Kevin Wilde and Craig Murdoch. The chairman of the board was Bruce Hamilton. After a brief tour of the area, they gathered at the platform for afternoon tea. The question was asked as to, um, by a board member, as to whether or not there was a um, building consent for the platform. And I do recall quite clearly the um, look of displeasure on the um, face of Bruce Watson, the conservator, when being told that um, it had not been, um, at that stage, um, obtained. Bruce Watson then spoke to both Kevin Wilde and Craig Murdoch, asking that they check the necessary consents had been sought and that follow-up action be taken. They did follow up to begin with, but a few months later, when the District Buller Council advised that retrospective consents could not be obtained, the application was filed away. The Commission found the regional conservator Bruce Watson to be very experienced, hardworking and competent. Perhaps he should have followed up the building consent issue, but in a properly structured system, that should not, in my view, be the responsibility of the regional conservator. Then in late January 1995, a warning sign that had been ordered for the platform arrived. The man who ordered it was away on holiday. In his absence, the sign was tidied away and forgotten. The Commission of Inquiry cleared all of the department's workers of any individual responsibility for the platform collapse. But as for the department, the catalogue of errors and oversights speaks for itself. Mistake number one, no building consent. Mistake number two, designer poorly qualified. Mistake number three, design faulty. Mistake number four, steel missing. Mistake number five, no plans used. Mistake number six, designer left out of construction group. Mistake number seven, builders poorly qualified. Mistake number eight, piles not aligned correctly. Mistake number nine, no bolts used. Mistake number 10, bearers badly nailed to piles. Mistake number 11, platform never attached to counterweight. Mistake number 12, loading sign lost.
11.25 on Friday morning, the upper viewing platform at Cave Creek with 18 people on it has plunged 30 meters into a boulder-strewn ravine. A Department of Conservation worker, a polytechnic tutor, and three students are left to cope. At that point we knew there was at least one survivor because someone was calling out, um, which just amazed me actually, that there was going to, you know, that would be, someone would be conscious. It's decided that Shirley Slatter will take student Mark Trainer and run out to the vehicles to radio for help. Tutor John Skilton will go to the bottom of the gorge with students Darren Gamble and Leanne Wheeler. I mentioned to Darren and Leanne that, that they need to be prepared for some fairly horrific scenes and that it wasn't going to be very nice. Just kind of kept moving our way, knew we were getting closer all the whole time, hearing people yelling, still screaming, all those kind of noises still, still going on. And so you know that people are alive. I never ever considered the possibility that people would be dead. We got closer and we could see the platform resting on the rocks and that snap in time of like seeing almost the reality of what you're dealing with is just like <gasps> and then the whole thing kind of switched for me like okay you've got to deal with this. Shirley and Mark reached the vehicles at a quarter to twelve. So then we got back to the vehicles and I discovered that Stephen had taken the keys with him and you had to have the keys on to get the radio to go. So I got there and I had a perfectly serviceable vehicle. In fact, I had three vehicles. Not one of them had a set of keys to them. They were all unlocked. We'd get into them and we couldn't use the radio. Shirley then asked Mark to run the seven kilometre gravel road to the nearest house. She had the presence of mind to write him this note. This is an emergency. We have 15 people approximately seriously injured. We need helicopters, scoop nets, medics, crash nets and manpower. We are at Cave Creek Resurgence, top platform collapsed, 100 foot drop. Soon after Mark left on foot, Shirley met two cyclists. She quickly sent them in pursuit of Mark. Someone, someone came and yelled out to me. And I, said, I asked them, I thought they might have had a message as well. And they said, no, he just gave me the bike. Mark was now able to complete the dash to the main road on the bike. It was a quarter past 12 when he reached the house of John Forrest and dialed 111. Mark was too exhausted and stressed to finish the call. Forrest took over, reading Shirley Slatter's note for him. It was 50 minutes since the platform collapsed. The West Coast rescue systems went on to full alert. A rescue helicopter from Christchurch would soon be on its way. An Air Force Iroquois was dispatched with a team of four medics. Three fire engines and a local rescue team would also be sent. Meanwhile, John, Darren and Leanne arrived at the bottom of Cave Creek. Well, our first sight was just a platform on the ground, and then suddenly Stacy kind of stood up in the background, and I just, you know, that was just amazing that someone could, was actually standing up, walking around. I was sitting up, and I was just having a look around. I, I couldn't take in that much at the time. I was, I was fairly, really shocked, and then John, the tutor, asked me to come down and sit next to Carol and talk to her. Caroline was screaming loudly, and she wanted us to get her out now, you know, that's basically what she was like, get me out of here, you know, help, help. And Scotty also was screaming and basically telling us the same thing. The space is very small and we're dealing with 18 people. So it was difficult to move around without stepping on people, I guess. And Most of the dead and dying had fallen forward ahead of the platform and had crashed onto and between the huge rocks. The platform had landed on top of them a fraction of a second later. This sketch was made by Leanne Wheeler for the commission. It shows the scene as she remembers it. So 11 people were crammed in the small hole with the platform on top. So it was quite difficult to get under there and actually get to people. We didn't know what to do with people, where to put them. It was um, physically and emotionally very difficult. After a few minutes, I think we had quite a good little team going with Darren and I finished doing the initial checking and trying to move people, and then, and then Leanne um, checking up on what we'd done and, and trying to comfort those that were conscious. When I took someone's pulse and it wasn't there, 
He's for the first time in my life, after taking many pulses, doing first aid courses and stuff, there's not one. It's, it's not there. And kind of the reality of something like that kind of hits you now. <gasps> During the next hour, they sorted the living from the dead, untangled the bodies, and gave what aid they could to the survivors. There was a, a creeping sense of helplessness as we realised that we were going to be could be there for quite some time, um, and some of the, you know the people were in state and um, injured or beyond what we could offer immediately in first in terms of first aid. We started writing lists of people's names, and so the reality started hitting of. All these people that we've written under no pulse was such a big proportion, such a huge chunk, and that several other people that were still alive, would they still be alive? One dock worker and 11 of Leanne's friends lay dead while six were still alive. Kit Pawsey was unconscious and breathing badly. He would die before help could arrive. Scott Murray was lying facing Caroline Smith and asking to be freed. He was very agitated. Four bodies had to be lifted to free him. An hour after the platform crash, Shirley Slatter arrived back with the clothing from the vehicles. And I remember coming in, I was feeling pretty, and my legs were like jelly, you know, sort of going down a whole heap of stairs and just feeling really nervous about going down there. Shirley expressed concern for her boss, Stephen O'Day. And John came over, he saw me and he came over and I said to him, you know, where's Steve? I need to get the keys off him. And um, he said, oh, I'm sorry, Steve's dead. So then it was sort of, all right then. And you just sort of, I guess, autopilot takes over, you bring the mask down and you push all your emotions away and you just go and do what you did. And one of my, probably my best friend there was Annie and she was actually the last person that I saw. And if I lost the plot at any point, that would have been it. She was at the bottom. I guess she was the least pretty of anyone. She's the person that scared me the most of how she looked and stuff. And knowing that for a second that she could never be alive. And if she was, I wouldn't want her to be because of how she was. And um, yeah, and at that point, I just wanted to basically bore, you know, and I just. An hour and a half had passed. There was still no sign of help. They started to wonder if the message had even got through. Where is help? Why aren't they here? We need someone. We can't do this by ourselves. And we didn't know anything. We were no doctors. We were no medical experts. And just trying to almost be that in some ways. Darren Gamble was about to set off with a second message when Chris Cowan's helicopter arrived overhead. It was such a big relief when someone was there, knowing that, that someone was there to help us, because it seemed like forever. It seemed so long before anyone got there. Um, up to that point, you know, we've, it was just waiting. Um, so to see him arrive on the scene and know that someone of his you know, local knowledge and competency was there was a great kind of relief. It was ten past one, a hundred minutes after the platform collapse, but no medical help had arrived. John and Shirley still had to make life and death decisions as to who should be airlifted out first. It was a toss up between Scotty and uh, Sam. So in the end we decided Sam was probably, in our opinion, the worst injured. We put him on the stretcher and, and it was so noisy, the helicopter made such a big noise that we ended up taking the stretcher off the strop and sending the helicopter away. So we were sort of down there trying to sort this out ourselves, not really knowing even how the stretcher works and what we're supposed to strap on or anything. We decided we'd fly Scotty out next and he started to get quite agitated. He was getting quite noisy and loud and um, not very happy. And so, yeah, I was up with Steve and I turned around and he'd stopped breathing. I think we all just about stopped breathing then. Scott Murray never revived. The second to be airlifted was Caroline Smith. She had a badly broken leg. It was now two o'clock. Next to be stretched out by helicopter was Stacy Mitchell. The first of the rescuers were now on the scene and one of them assisted Leanne Wheeler out, exhausted and very distressed. Because of spinal injuries, 
Stephen Hannan had to wait until medics arrived before he could be airlifted out by the Air Force Iroquois. At half past two, just over three hours after the platform collapsed, Shirley and John would walk the 40-minute track out. For the first time, they would be able to think about what had happened. I mean, they were my students. I was responsible for their safety. That's, 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 how, I, that's how I work. And, um, you know, that's how I felt when I left there. So I knew that, that we'd just gone... It hadn't ended. We were just going from one situation to another, whatever that was going to be. And I also had still had Darren and Leanne and Mark to look after. Um, and, you know, subsequently, um, yeah, we were on our own still until late into the evening on, on that night. I mean, we still didn't have any... There was no one coming along and holding our hand. I mean, that was, you know, um, or from anywhere. The day was long. It was a really long day. We didn't get back to Greymouth until 7 o'clock at night. And so much at the centre of a tragedy and not realising it not realising that so many people knew and so many people would be affected and I, just, I didn't understand it all. had no concept of how big it was or what had actually happened or anything like that. It took three hours for the police and rescue teams to airlift out the 14 dead bodies. By quarter past six, the dead had been moved to a temporary morgue set up at the Grey Base Hospital. It took until eight o'clock for all the bodies to be formally identified. Only now could the parents be notified, eight and a half hours after the tragedy had occurred. Saturday, April 29th, 1995. It's the morning after the tragedy, and the close-knit community of Greymouth is in shock. The Director General of the Department of Conservation, Bill Mansfield, and Simon Upton, the Acting Minister of Conservation, visit the scene of the tragedy. The police investigation is already well underway. Monday morning, Prime Minister Jim Bolger was among the hundreds of mourners who attended the memorial service for the victims. That day, the government announced a commission of inquiry. It began hearing evidence on the 11th of July and was to go through to the end of September. I went across to um, Greymouth to head to the inquiry with the genuine sort of um, desire to know what had happened. I thought it would be all over and done with in a day, in my naivety. That um, yes, we would go through it, and everybody would have the um, the willingness to sort of share and see what happened and stop it ever happening again. I thought once again naively that the basis of the inquiry would look at issues to do with not just what went wrong and why, but who was to blame. And um, people were very quick to say the families don't want this to happen again. Well, for me, that was implicit. That's like you know the the captain of the Titanic saying we won't go near that iceberg again. Right at the very start of the inquiry, Doc, through their um, lawyer, Hugh Rennie, accepted responsibility. They couldn't do anything else because it was quite obvious they'd built the platform and the platform fell down, so they were responsible. But then they spent the rest of the inquiry trying to not accept blame. It became about funding, it became about restructuring, and I thought to myself, um, this is become, going to become a lot bigger. Than, than what it started out as. It started out as a tragedy. It's now going to enter the political arena. The Commission's terms of reference included reporting on the causes of the collapse, the design and construction of the platform, the competence of those responsible, and the level of inspections following construction. As well, it was to report on whether those involved acted lawfully, properly, and competently. The commission was later extended to inquire into the rescue operation. It wasn't going to be a simple little inquiry. It was, a, it was complex. And if we were going to get anywhere, um, this was going to take a, a pretty much a determined effort to make sure that step by step by step, the sins of omission were 
covered and those people who uh, were guilty of that omission were located. I guess in a way an inquiry is a very cunning way of um, diverting the whole notion of things going wrong, particularly in a corporate agency, a government agency. While Grant Cameron would put forward that individuals should be found negligent at both head office and field centre levels, Hugh Rennie, counsel for DOC, would present the concept of systemic failure to explain the tragedy. The submission that I put to the Commissioner was that uh, Cave Creek was the result of systemic failure. Each person had uh, brought their small contribution of error or inappropriate timing or whatever it was, each in themselves quite minor, um, but cumulatively disastrous. The Commission delivered its report on the 10th of November. Good evening. The Cave Creek inquiry named no names, but it pointed the finger of blame squarely at the government and the conservation minister. Commissioner Judge Noble would find that the department acted unlawfully, but the named individuals did not. The department did not act in a competent and appropriate manner, nor did its nominated staff members, but all the while they were working within a system that was fatally flawed. I conclude that it would be quite inappropriate to point the finger of blame at any one of the individuals. It is uniquely an institutional failure. The striking feature of the inquiry is that not one of the individuals concerned was ever aware of the appropriate standards to be met, simply because no such set of standards was in place. It was this lack of a proper system that caused the Cave Creek platform to fall, with such tragic consequences. Nobody was actually named and found to be wanting except the whole department and, that, and as such Judge Noble had the government being um, at, to blame for the, the, the whole saga. You, you couldn't actually see something tangible happening like a jail sentence, a fine, prosecutions of some sort. So there was always this feeling that it was never completed. Under the concept of systemic failure, everyone collectively at DOC was to blame. No individual was truly accountable. Systemic failure was an outcome that would provoke journalist Graham Hunt to write a book called Scandal at Cave Creek. Graham Hunt was the first to publicly tackle the issue of mismanagement at senior levels within the department. Well, there is no such thing as systemic failure. This is sort of a word game that uh, Judge Noble came up with. You know, systems only fail because people err. Um, or, in some instances, there might be an act of God, it might be a volcanic eruption or an earthquake. None of that at all. This was completely avoidable. Quite clearly, systems don't... Um, they aren't created by themselves. They don't maintain themselves. They are operated and maintained by people. So the question is, who created the system? Who had the obligation to oversee it? and who is responsible for its failure. For the parents, the concept of systemic failure has been hard to accept. We were sort of suddenly dealing with this amorphous mass known as systems, and uh, yet we were very clear who the individuals were who were involved in it. It's quite clear. It came out in the inquiry, both from those who built it, both from those who should have checked it, and the orders that were being followed, and who should have been overseeing it. And then it led right back, for me, quite um, logically in sequence back to head office as to the people who put these systems in place. So I expected the next stage to be then naming those people, but that, that's where it stopped short, the inquiry stopped at that point. Prosecutions were very unlikely after Commissioner Judge Noble found that no single individual fell below a standard of care. Occupational safety and health is one government department that can prosecute in cases such as Cave Creek. After their investigation, they decided that management systems were deficient to the extent that the employees concerned really didn't have the opportunity to perform at the required safe level. The other department which could prosecute is the police. Former detective Kevin Burrows was in charge of their investigation. He's still surprised no individuals were prosecuted. It's hard to believe, again, this is my personal opinion, that no person or no body has been held accountable for that um, structure collapsing. Because, as I said, I, to me, it was a disgrace. So why no police prosecutions? The police report was forwarded to the Solicitor General, John McGrath, 
it was his decision not to proceed. I find the actions of the Crown Law Office inexplicable. In terms of the evidence uh, on my file and certainly uh, revealed to the Commission of Inquiry, uh, there should have been prosecutions of quite a wide range of people and that would have included people at the very highest levels within the department. Some of the families still dissatisfied by the result considered private prosecution. We feel that if we take the government to court, obviously the government's got the taxpayers' funds to dip into and they will just stretch it out from here to eternity. They simply didn't have the wherewithal to possibly contemplate a prosecution of that magnitude and quite plainly it isn't their obligation or responsibility, it's the Crown's obligation to pursue prosecutions of this nature and that's what should have happened. And all the evidence that I heard um, and saw, I don't believe any attempt to prosecute anybody would have been successful. But if Judge Noble found that the Department of Conservation had acted unlawfully, why wasn't the department prosecuted? Quite simply, it's not possible to prosecute a government department in this way. And here the Commission recommended a dramatic change, that the Crown no longer be exempt from prosecution under the likes of the Building Act and the Health and Safety and Employment Act. It's the one part of the Noble Report which hasn't been implemented, and it's now three years since the accident, and one relatively simple law change has still got to be carried out, and as far as I can see, with the letters I've been writing, that no action has been taken as yet to change the law. DOC, the department which admitted full responsibility for building a faulty platform and killing 14 people, was never penalized. This has caused a deep sense of injustice. The release of the Commission's report would bring an end to the prospects of individual prosecutions. So who or what was responsible for the systemic failure of DOC? It's got to, at the end of the day, come back to, well, who decided on these systems? Who put them in place? They did not appear magically, the systems. And that's certainly back to head office. In my personal view, there had been grave errors uh, committed at head office level and that there wasn't a full understanding of management disciplines and how they should apply to an organisation of this size. Head office, certainly some people up there possibly made mistakes, some people locally made mistakes, but most of all, it was an expression of making less go further. Most of all, it was an expression of what has happened politically in this country since 1988, of expecting people to do more with less. And sometimes you come a guts around that. When the Noble Report was released, many expected the resignations of DOC's Director General Bill Mansfield and Conservation Minister Dennis Marshall. I think in my, in my position it would be, after a lot of reflection I might add, the soft way out for me uh, to walk away. We've got a lot of work to do. People in other governments re resign over silly little things, but this was, this was huge. Although Bill Mansfield had been Director General of DOC for five years, the State Services report on Cave Creek would exonerate his performance as a manager. He also chose to stay on in order to put things right. I certainly don't think that the chief executive should have been praised as one of the top chief executives in the country and being told that he had performed in his position in an exemplary fashion. That was, that was insulting when the department that he was in charge of had just broken the law and killed 14 people as a result. Every day that Bill Mansfield stayed in that job and went to work for this family was like driving the knife deeper. I could not understand how this man had decided that he was indispensable, that it required him at the helm, when in fact the worst possible thing that could ever happen is the loss of life, surely, regardless of your job, yet he stayed on. Bob Gregory is a senior lecturer in public policy and administration at Victoria University. He studied Cave Creek in terms of political responsibility. In the history of New Zealand government and public administration, I think Cave Creek is quite unprecedented. There's never before, before been a case in which people have died 
as a direct consequence of the incompetence of uh, government officials. I, I think that the lesson to be learned is that a, a tragedy of this sort does demand a response, and I believe the proper time for that response was after Judge Noble's report was released uh, late in 1995. Really My own personal belief is that both the Minister and the Chief Executive ought to have resigned. I don't think that um, symbolic gestures in that sense help very much. I think that if you got everybody together and got over the initial uh, feeling of revenge, which is what everybody always wants, whether they like it or not, you want revenge, the next thing they'd want is that they'd want to know that it was fixed, they'd want to know it wouldn't happen again. But on the other hand, uh, as a failure of responsibility to make sure that it didn't happen in the first place, and the act of atonement through resignation is necessary, and whoever takes over uh, from the person who's resigned, that person well, quite clearly has the responsibility to ensure that it won't happen again. The only act of reconciliation the parents were to receive was the resignation of Doc's West Coast conservator, Bruce Watson. The Conservancy needs a fresh start, and also as a gesture of reconciliation to those who were affected in any way at all by Cave Creek. Having sat through all the, the hearings and things, the, peop the parents who were there all the time built up their feelings about the people and the one person who resigned, Bruce Watson, we, was the one that we really felt he'd done his job thoroughly and he was doing the decent thing but he didn't need to resign because he'd done his job honestly. About a year after the tragedy, Dennis Marshall would resign although he would remain a full member of Cabinet. I believe it's an appropriate time for me to step down from my role as Minister of Conservation. And then in January 1997, Bill Mansfield also resigned. I was not uh, pushed, I haven't been asked to resign. Uh, it's always been my intention to see the change process through to its completion. In the case of the chief, chief executive, I believe the gesture was too late and it also appeared to be taken under pressure. I don't, can't say that it was, but that certainly was the public uh, perception to, to some extent. So I think overall uh, there was too little too late, and I think it's certainly too late now, and the ultimate outcome has been a failure of political responsibility. Uh, we left with the impression that uh, government departments as impersonal systems can virtually do what they like to citizens in this country, uh, even cause their deaths directly. Bill Mansfield considered carefully whether he would appear in this program. In the end, he decided it would be inappropriate and unnecessary. So, three years on, what impact has Cave Creek had on the Department of Conservation? Since Cave Creek, the department has been reorganised based on the best private sector and, and, in my opinion, international advice for an operational organisation. We've been structured now with clear lines of accountability. Um, we've placed more people in the field. We're giving a, a, we have absolutely overhauled our systems. We have, as I said, reorganised the structure. We've given a new sense of purpose to staff and we have um, upskilled staff at a field level and are continuing that process. It's quite clear in the uh, contracts for public servants that have been introduced this year, in fact the one I have, that faced with a similar event and similar circumstances, absolutely similar circumstances, my resignation is not only required, it will be given. Cave Creek has become a memorial to those who lost their lives. Each of the parents has had to find their own way in dealing with the loss of their child. We actually took a stone in off the Cable Bay beach with Evan's name on it and left it at the site. And, and it, was, it was actually like a little pilgrimage for us, taking Evan's um, little stone that we had with his name engraved on it off our patch of the world and to take it there and place it where he died. Yes, I feel that just because he died we didn't stop loving him and I'll always love him. 
he's my son, my eldest son, the first baby I ever had. So he'll always be that special person for me. We, we're working hard at letting him go and allowing ourselves to move on and to have a healthy attitude to his death. It's something that you work at daily and I wish I could say it was over. But I think for the rest of my life, I will always mourn for that child, that son of mine. To keep their memories alive, the Pawsies have created a memorial to Kit on their farm. It's a stone from the farm, a, a great big rock. And we placed it by a duck pond, little duck pond, which Kit used to play with, play in when he was a child. <laughs> he used to catch frogs and tadpoles there. I took exception to people telling me to um, buck up, get on. From a logical point of view, probably very sound advice and what you should do, but um, yeah, it's extremely hard to get on with it. And it's even harder to get on with it when someone tells you to get on with it. And I think if I got any advice from anybody, it's to refrain from that ex expression. For a long time, Rod Davis visited Jody's grave every day. Writing poems was his way of remembering his son. This one is called Headstone. I talk to you now in stone, etched, carved, granite solid, and words that remind of dreams. The symbol of a life, death, rising towards all the elements, this once passed by cemetery hurls at you. A well-worn path leads to your place, under skies both wild grey and brilliant blue, and as I water your flowers with tears, I remember you, Jodie, in ways that memories are only a part. This is your mountain now. Let it hold, caress, and protect like childhood, my son. For the Shaws, getting over the loss of Peter has meant selling their business in Wairoa and starting a new life on a deer farm near Fielding. We've had drastic changes in our lives to, to try and cope with it, we've actually sold our business and we moved. But you don't get away from it. Some days I just cry all day and it doesn't have to be anything specific. You just wake up in the morning and you know that it's going to be a terrible day. I think those sort of days you literally do nothing except sit and feel sorry for yourself. Then other days you, you cope and uh, we're certainly coping a lot better than we were but the, the emptiness is still there. Three years down the track, it's not a lot different than the day after it happened for us. We feel like we've been given a life sentence. It's, um, you just can't get away from it. Carolyn Chisholm's deep and abiding Christian faith has been essential for her peace of mind. Um, this is a little prayer that, he, that Paul wrote on the 28th of February, just after that. Oh couple of weeks I suppose after they'd started the course get right with the Lord earth is such a short time that we must step into the other world as much as we can and bring it back then on March the 21st if you're a climber and you're not dead you're either lucky or you're not climbing hard enough I lost my husband and my father my father-in-law and my son in those four years um, and if it hadn't been that I'd had this rock which my life was built on um, I just can't imagine where I would be um, that's not to say it's made it any easier in a sense because the pain is no different but it wasn't like I was walking it alone Gary Reed has spent hours studying the submissions of evidence for the Commission of Inquiry but he doesn't believe he's been able to move on at all I don't think it'll get easier I think you'll just get used to living with it I believe that if this ends up in court where it should be, there'll be a big milestone behind us. And we can move on. But until that happens, we're stuck. Sometimes I think that I'm getting on with life and things are getting into perspective. And then something little happens and you realise that it's not that it's still there, it's probably think about it every day. I would have loved to have seen what happened with Catherine. She either would have been a fantastic success or 
unemployable. I don't know which way she would have turned out, but uh, she certainly had a zest for life. Stephen Hannan says he has a new appreciation of life. I value life a lot more now, and things are more of a challenge. Just a little day, every day, things like going to the fridge and getting a drink, or going to the letterbox and getting the mail out. People tend to think that because of what I've lost, I'm going to be depressed and unhappy all the time, but um, that's not okay. I mean, everyone has their bad days. I get, I get probably lower days than a lot of people, but the good days far exceed what most people would expect. I uh, enjoy myself a lot more than probably what I used to. Sam Lucas considers himself lucky, not only physically, but mentally. I am, I guess, in a way proud that I did survive that and the fact that I have got on with my life and that I am doing other things. I went back, finished that course off, did another course, and now I'm doing university. I'm going to get a degree, you know. Hopefully I'm going to get teacher's college, you know, and I'm going to do all that type of stuff. And just I'm proud of the fact that I've got on with my life and that it hasn't, you know, completely destroyed me. And what about the people who worked for Doc? By now, almost all have moved on, deeply affected by their involvement in the tragedy. I would just like those people that are involved in building that platform to, to acknowledge that, that uh, the pain is great and it's still great and it would be good to hear them say, we are really sorry. Kevin Wilde was one of those who considered the question deeply as to whether he would appear in this documentary. In the end, he sent us this fax. This fax is to advise you that I continue to be severely emotionally affected by the Cave Creek tragedy, and that because of additional and unbearable stress to my family and myself, I have decided not to be interviewed. I remain deeply, deeply sorry for the victims and their families, and no doubt will continue to do so for the rest of my life. This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee, so you can see more of New Zealand on air.